Welcome to this week's edition of A Plus Weekly, my news roundup of what has caught my eye this week in the tech world, focusing on the Apple ecosystem and all the things that are newsworthy, useful, and some fun too. A Plus Weekly comes out first on YouTube as a video podcast to watch along and a few days later out on the usual podcast platforms. Please do like, subscribe, follow, leave a five-star review, and even some kind words. It all helps so much to help people find this show. Thank you. Okay, let's roll up with what's coming up this week with more disquiet on the Apple VR headset. How iOS 17 doesn't look like it's going to be all that affected by resources being diverted to deal with that headset. Tim Cook's visit to China and some interesting China sales data. A roundup of the new features landing on your device with iOS 16.4. Apple classical music rolls out on time. How the eSIM might be coming to your new iPhone pretty soon. And some thoughts about the possible future of the iPad and whether it has one at all. First up, more news of disquiet with the soon to be released Apple VR headset, or is it? The New York Times has an interesting take on this, with some behind the scenes sources adding further weight to the rumor that there is disquiet about the product and whether the timing is right for this to be released. Eight staff members, both past and present, who have asked to remain anonymous due to Apple's rules against discussing future products have said that the initial enthusiasm at Apple has been replaced with doubt. At a company where employees have worked together to create products such as the iPod and Apple Watch with the same zeal as a moonshot, it isn't common to see these kinds of disagreements and divided opinions. According to three people who have knowledge of the situation, some employees had broken away from the project due to their worries about its potential, and people have been let go due to a lack of advancement with some aspects of the headset, including its usage of Apple's Siri voice assistant, according to one source. The Apple headset is considered a crucial signal for the progress of virtual and augmented reality technology. For more than 10 years, tech leaders have been discussing the possibility possibility of it becoming the next phase of computing after the smartphone. Apple's chief executive Tim Cook told university students last year that in the near future you'll wonder how you lived your life without augmented reality. Just like today you wonder how did people like me grow up without the internet. Yeah, me too. AR's journey has been full of flops, wrong turns and letdowns, from Google Glass to Magic Leap, from Microsoft's HoloLens to Meta's Quest Pro. Apple's success in blending hardware and software for revolutionary devices has made it a potential savior. So there's no pressure there, Apple. And make no mistake, the challenges are still incredibly tough to surmount. Unlike the iPhone, which used a bunch of existing tech, virtual reality is making Apple and others create new chips and displays, said Matthew Ball, author of The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything. The difficulty of the problem has been far greater than anyone expected, he added. Rumors are circulating that Apple's project might be delayed, especially in light of the economic situation, according to those involved. The company's delayed other new stuff before, like AirTags, those coin-sized locating tracking devices. They waited over a year to launch them whilst they sorted out privacy stuff, but currently the headset is rolling for an expected reveal in June, people said. Counterpoint Research, a market research firm, predicts Apple will ship fewer than 500,000 headsets in a year. By comparison, it was believed that 40 million Apple Watches would be sent out following its launch. Modest expectations for the headsets reflects the troubles in the category, which saw sales dip 12% to $1.1 billion last year, according to NPD Group. Internal skeptics have asked if the new device is just a solution trying to find a problem. The iPod and iPhone were clear successes with digital music and a phone slash music player combo, but the headset hasn't been as clear cut in its vision, these people said. The product is being developed during a period of internal leadership limbo too, and that might be showing. Evans Hankey stepped up to be Johnny Ive's successor in industrial design and then left. With design's leadership unclear, Mike Rockwell, an engineer, has been the lead in creating the device. 
So now we get to the bit that really rings alarm bells for me, aside from the fact that these goggles are going to cost around $3,000 and won't fit over prescription glasses and will reportedly need some kind of external battery pack carried around on your hip. Apple have been putting their energy into making the device perfect for video calls and hanging out as avatars in a virtual world. The company dubbed their central app Co-Presence for when you experience the same space as someone remotely. It seems pretty similar to what Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook calls the metaverse, though Tim Cook is notably avoiding this term. The device will supposedly double as a tool for artists, designers, and engineers, tracking them as they draw freely in space in image editing applications and tracking hand gestures for the editing of virtual reality films. And Apple may focus their initial push out to large design outfits rather than the 1 billion iPhone users who may well be left scratching their heads wondering what the fuss is about. Some are comparing Apple's strategy with this device to Tesla's strategy with the Roadster, its initial $100,000 electric vehicle. Eventually, Tesla followed it with lower priced cars with broader appeal. We'll wait and see. But if we carry on that metaphor, perhaps the Apple headset should be an SUV to deal with the possible rocky road ahead. <laughs> Bloomberg's Mark Gurman had reported that there would be fewer major changes for iOS 17 due to the Apple VR headset, that I've mentioned this in a past episode too. Gurman now states the upcoming update will have a lot of features that people were asking for. The iOS 17 release is now expected to boast several nice to have features, even if it lacks a tent pole improvement like last year's revamped lock screen. The goal of the software, codenamed Dawn, is to check off several of users' most requested features. German's suggestion is that iOS 17 won't really shake up the iPhone experiences. Apple has already given us things like personalized lock screens and custom keyboards. We might have to make do with incremental changes, a bit like those in iOS 16.4, released just a couple of days ago by the time I put this podcast out. Check out my rundown on those upgrades later in this show. During the China Development Forum this week, a meeting took place between Apple CEO Tim Cook and China's Minister of Commerce in the midst of strained relations between Washington and Beijing. Tim used his first public remarks on his visit to China to praise the country for its rapid innovation and its long ties with the company, according to local media reports. Innovation is developing rapidly in China and I believe it will further accelerate, Cook was quoted by the paper news outlet as saying. Tim Cook's visit comes at a time when Apple has been looking to reduce its supply chain reliance on China and moving production to new up and coming centers such as India. Last year, production at the world's largest iPhone factory run by Apple supplier Foxconn was heavily disrupted after China's zero COVID policies fueled worker unrest. Check out episode two of the podcast for more on that India play by Apple. Cook's stop at an Apple store in Beijing was all over Chinese social media on Friday. In his speech, Cook touched on education and how young people need programming and thinking skills. Apple's apparently increasing its rural education spend in the country to 100 million yuan, local media reported. On Saturday, Cook told an audience in the China Development Forum that Apple and China have grown together and the relationship between the two is symbiotic. Apple relies on China for about 20% of overall sales, and the company's most important products are still made mostly in China. This is still a very important relationship for Apple, and the CEO's visit will have been noted. More on the importance of the China market coming up right now. Apple's iPhone 13 was the best-selling smartphone in China in 2022. Not only that, one in three iPhones sold in China in 2022 was an iPhone 13. According to CounterPoint Research's global monthly handset model sales tracker, that's a mouthful, Apple's iPhone 13 contributed to 37% of the brand's smartphone sales in China in 2022. Apple took the top three positions in the list of China's top 10 best-selling smartphones and Honor had an impressive four spots, the highest they've ever had. Vivo came away with two spots and Oppo got one. 
Apple made up more than 10% of China's smartphone sales last year. The iPhone 13 was the biggest hit in China, 6.6% of the market, up from 2.3% in 2021 when it was in third place. The iPhone 13 sales blew up in 2022 compared to that year before. The iPhone 13 was followed by the 13 Pro Max and the 13 Pro in the next two spots. These three iPhones made up 60% of Apple's smartphone sales in 2022. This was the first time that the Apple's Pro variants were in the top 10 list for China. It looks like the China market might be moving uptown. It's been 41 days since Apple last issued a software update for your iPhone. I hope you've managed to get through since then. Honestly, sometimes it can get a little overwhelming with all the updates. But this one is a fairly big one. iOS 16.4 has graced the stage and here's what you can expect. Or perhaps you're already seeing it if you've already updated your device. Still, a few of these you may not have actually noticed yet. So let me give you a rundown of what's new and how to access it. When you update your iPhone, you'll get 21 new emojis. 31 if you add skin tones. We've got a goose, moose, maracas, flute, and a smiley that goes jiggle. Phone calls are getting voice isolation mode in iOS 16.4. This feature highlights your voice during calls while blocking out any distracting background noise. Theoretically, you can now take a call in a bustling street or a crowded room and still be heard. Now this feature isn't new to iOS. Apple previously rolled it out with iOS 15 for FaceTime calls. Oddly, wide spectrum, which brings in more background noise, isn't here for iPhone phone calls just yet. Still just FaceTime. Most people know about the App Store, but did you know you can put web apps on your home screen too? You can add any website to your home screen as a shortcut. And if the site has a true web app, it will run from the app you added. Now with iOS 16.4, developers can send you notifications from web apps. It gives your iPhone a Mac feel, since websites can send notifications just like apps. But actually, no. Websites won't be able to send you notifications on iOS, only web apps. But it's still a cool change. iOS 16's Duplicates album made it super easy to spot and delete duplicate photos in your library. Duplicates will now also add duplicate photos from your iCloud shared photo library to the album. So you can now get rid of extra photos in your shared library and just keep the best ones of your friends and family. In theory, the crash detection feature on the iPhone 14 should be awesome. If you get into an accident and you can't use your iPhone, it'll call the emergency services and even tell your emergency contacts what's just happened. Unfortunately, the feature can mistake skiing for a car accident. Not joking here. Apple says iOS 16.4 has made some optimizations to crash detection, so hopefully it won't call the cops on you when you take the fam to the slopes. Apple caught some heat when it put out its new podcast app, but it's been getting a bit better bit by bit. The new update has some minor new features, plus it builds on the improvements. Mac Rumors points out that you can see a channels menu with all the shows from a podcast network or a particular podcaster. The up next area has all your saved episodes plus ones from shows you're not following and you'll also be able to get rid of shows from your queue. You'll get new information when checking out your shows, like how many unplayed episodes there are left for each podcast. And if your car's compatible with CarPlay, you'll be able to check out Up Next, Recently Played, and some special picks in the Browse tab. So, Apple Classical Music app for your iPhone is here. You may remember from a previous show that it's for iPhone only, not your iPad, and it rolled out on March 28th. Let's take a swift tour through the app. The app is divided into four tabs for you, browse, library, and search. Same as Apple Music, the Listen Now tab gives you tailored suggestions. Apple has playlists for time periods, genres, what's new, composers, and even moods like sleepy songs or morning music. The Browse tab helps you discover songs by orchestras, choirs, and instruments. And the search has been designed to list composers, works, and tracks. 
the now playing screen doesn't have a foggy background and the lyrics button has been changed to one that displays details about the music instead. An interesting quirk about Apple Music Classical is that the regular Apple Music Library doesn't show up in the Classical app. However, your classical songs will show up in the regular Apple Music app. Yep, quirky. So why did Apple release a classical music only app rather than integrate it into Apple Music? Well, they have released a statement saying that in short, it's the complex metadata associated with classical music. They tell us that classical music often involves multiple musicians recording works that have been recorded many times before that are referred to by different names in multiple languages. They went on, only a brand new app with specialized features and a beautiful interface designed for the genre could remove the complexity and make classical music easily searchable, browsable, and accessible for beginners and experts alike. Mystery solved. Is the SIM tray that disappeared in the US from the iPhone 14 going to disappear in other countries too? with the iPhone 15. French website Mac Generation says that the iPhone 15 and 15 Pro may come out without a SIM card tray in France in 2023. This means the devices would only work with eSIMs for cellular connectivity. If the SIM card gets taken out of France, it's likely to happen in some other countries too, since Apple usually sticks to one iPhone model for Europe. For example, the iPhone 14 Pro A2890 sold in France is also sold in the UK, Ireland, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Austria, Poland, the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and dozens of other countries. Apple axed the SIM card tray from all iPhone models in the US last September, requiring customers to use an eSIM. Apple has a support file with a rundown of carriers that use eSIM tech globally. When that iPhone 14 series was released in the US, Apple was pushing eSIMs as more secure than physical SIMs, as you couldn't take them from a lost or stolen iPhone. Apple said you can manage up to eight eSIMs in the iPhone settings app, meaning no need to get, carry, or swap physical SIM cards when you're traveling iPhone 13 and newer can have two eSIMs running concurrently. The SIM card tray does look like it's going to go away eventually, thanks to eSIM, even if it's a few years down the line. That seems inevitable. So buckle up for some teething troubles as the numbers starting to use eSIMs across the world increases rapidly, most likely from later this year. <laughs> Now, in a previous show, you may have heard me run down the latest rumors on the arrival of a possible touchscreen on MacBooks. In Business Insider, Michael Gartenberg, an ex-Apple executive, wrote about having an iPad Pro and having multiple iPads in the past 10 years. His iPad used to be his go-to on trips, more so than his laptop, but not anymore. He says his iPod is in a spot between failing and succeeding and Apple must pay careful attention. In his damning essay earlier this month, he says that much has changed in the smartphone world, and the most important part of the iPad has not kept up. Today, he uses a Galaxy Z Fold 4, which transforms from a 6.1 inch smartphone into a 7.8 inch tablet, about the size of an iPad mini. And he has a MacBook Air, which has spectacular performance and battery life, according to him. The way he sees it, one of the iPad's biggest issues is that its hardware is increasingly overpowered relative to the apps available for the device. Every new iPad is faster and better, but the apps just don't live up to Apple's claims of desktop class, quality, and quantity. Another major issue he has is that the user interface based on iOS has become increasingly complicated over time. Every iOS release from Apple has more features, making it more powerful, but also more complex. This has made it hard for users to locate the features they need, resulting in confusion and sometimes more than a little irritation. Gartenberg gives the example of the iPad supporting a wide variety of gestures, including swipes, pinches, and taps that can be used to navigate and interact with apps. But many users find these gestures difficult to learn, and they're not evident unless you get extra help or guidance beyond the iPad's instructions. 
Another example he cites is Stage Manager. The iPad's new showcase feature for multitasking isn't even turned on by default. It's hidden away and to his mind, for good reason. He claims it's difficult to use and he would need to write a full length review to describe just how truly awful his experience with it has been. Strong stuff. He believes that the rumors of an upcoming MacBook with touchscreen reinforces the idea of the iPad being a second class device, even the pro versions. His view is that a touchscreen MacBook would make the iPad practically obsolete. Virtually anything one can do now on an iPad would be possible on a Mac, while the reverse would not be true. The iPad's great for web browsing and streaming, but when it comes to getting stuff done, the touchscreen MacBook would be seen as the better preferable option. An iPhone with its large screen is great for consuming media and it's more portable than the iPad. And that might just perhaps explain the transition towards the iPhone 14 Plus and away from the mini, maybe. If Apple wants to continue to succeed with the iPad, Gartenberg thinks it needs to address these challenges head on. That may mean simplifying the iOS user interface, investing more in the development of iPad specific apps and focusing on its internal software to better leverage the strengths of the iPad's hardware. What are your thoughts about the iPad? Still your go-to device for productivity? Or have you ventured out of the Apple ecosystem to get things done or to do other things or even to do things differently? Be sure to drop me a line or a comment. I'd love to hear from you. I've thought about this a little myself to the point where I'll be paying close attention to those touchscreen MacBook rumors, especially as M series apps for the iPad would work on those. Because perhaps when push comes to shove, I'd probably go for a touchscreen MacBook over an iPad Pro especially if I could flip it over and I could use the Apple Pencil with it. If you've been hanging out for my review of Watch GPT and Interface for Chat GPT AI on your Apple Watch, that's up on my YouTube channel now. A link is in the show notes. And that's a wrap for this week. Subscribe and hit that bell to make sure you don't miss my next video or podcast. I'm Saab Choel and this is A+. I've hoped you've enjoyed this week's show. Try this video next if you're watching on YouTube. And thanks for watching and listening. Cheers now.